Oh, we got people from all over coming in. We've got people from Germany, South Africa, Spokane, Washington, Beacon, New York, California, South Africa, Eugene, Oregon, Longmont, Colorado, Mendocino, New South Wales, Australia, Washington, Vermont, Vancouver, Hungary, Berkshire, UK, South Africa, California, Brooklyn, more California, more Oregon. Fantastic. Got a geologist from Mexico, Igor, good to have you here. Austria, Australia, Savannah, Tennessee, Jamie from Lanceville, nice to have you here. Dali and Dali Borka from Serbia, fantastic. Netherlands, uh, great. Somebody's doing the Water Stories core course with uh, Zach Weiss, fantastic human. Mohamed Umash is from Pakistan, Karen from Vancouver Island. Fantastic, folks. Welcome. Welcome one, welcome all. Fantastic to have you all here. Nick from Crete, Greece. Nick was a student in the Oregon State University Permaculture Design Pro class. Also took the Climate Resiliency class. Fantastic. Wow. Good to see you guys all here. Well, folks, I think we'll get ourselves started. Uh, I know Neil and Jeff are excited to share the conversation. Welcome everybody to Low Tech Erosion Control uh, Masterclass webinar. I know Neil and Jeff kind of shudder when we say things like master and masterclass, but having experienced their education before and the scope and breadth of their conversation, I, I say that with with full honesty and, and lots of enthusiasm. My name is Javin Bernakovich. I own and operate All Points Design, a land and life design company that works internationally at allpointsdesign.ca. And I also run Regenerative Living, a online e-platform that intent is to teach practical skills to live on the planet as if we intend to stay without getting mired in all the isms and ologies that can kind of keep us a little bit in our tracks instead of actually going out and doing good practical work. Today, I've got the great pleasure to introduce you to two incredible instructors, not to mention practitioners. First is Jeffrey Adams. He's the founder and principal of Terra Sophia LLC. Jeff builds capacity to regenerate the health of our watersheds by engaging community members through hands-on education projects and ecological design build services. He has a depth, and I know he wrote this, and he says he has a depth, but I would say he has more of a Grand Canyon of experience in water harvesting educational training programs and brings a practical and integrated approach to each project with over 20 years of experience in various aspects of construction and landscapes and trades. And I would also say as an all-round exceptional practitioner when it comes to everything ecological. Our other instructor is Neil Bertrando. He's the owner and operator of RT Permaculture, a regenerative design and consulting firm based in Reno, Nevada. Neil works with homesteaders, farmsteaders, homesteaders, farmers, nonprofits, and agencies to empower ecological lifestyles and food systems. He's a co-founder of Reno Food Systems, working to improve local food systems through ecological farming and participation in the local food movement. Not to mention he runs a heck of an incredible nursery and also is an incredible human. Kind of funny when you're in this realm, you tend to find some of the best humans around, and it just so happens that we have them both here today with us. Today, folks, we're going to get an opportunity to learn what low-tech erosion controls are, these incredible shovel-ready found material conversations that can be put into slow and pacify water, allow for soil to start to slow and settle, and then revegetate and create incredibly lush landscapes. Towards the end of our conversation, we're going to get a chance for Q&A. So if you do have any questions, make sure to put them in the Q&A box in Zoom, not in the chat. And because we are feeling particularly feisty today, we're going to do a draw. And three people who are still on the call by the end are going to be drawn and will get enrollment into the low-tech erosion control self-paced on-demand course that Neil and Jeff put together last year, which has... 14 hours of educational materials, four hours of Q&A, 50 plus curated resources, uh, plus some incredible checklists for you to learn how to design and implement low-tech erosion controls. So please do stick around if you want to be included in the draw. I think with that, folks, I'm going to pass it on over to Neil and Jeff, our presenters. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you so much for being here. 
Thanks, Javin. Great to be here. I'm excited to, to share with all the people that have joined us. Thanks, everyone, for, for joining. All right, so <clears throat> we're going to get started here. Our presentation today is on low-tech erosion control. One of the focuses of low-tech erosion control is to stop erosion. And coincidentally, at the same time, you harvest water and increase vegetative productivity. So it's an all-around great tactic. So what is low-tech erosion control? Well, it's basically using natural materials, such as sticks, rocks, gravel, earth, plants, to create erosion control structures and heal watersheds. Also, it's a broad toolkit of scalable and shovel-ready techniques, things that you can implement by hand and also with heavy equipment like this excavator pictured here. You can see a few examples um, in the top right of uh, low-tech erosion control integrated into a uh, camping and, and school site where there's both pathways, water harvesting basins, and buildings all integrated into a managed water flow and, and mitigate erosion. Uh, also of a slope wetland meadow where we have a head cut control structure with a log step down. And then uh, in the drylands of California, some vertical mulch straw mulching that was just done quickly with a, a shovel and a hand crew. So you can see there's a, a wide range of applications. Low tech erosion control uh, was kind of born out of both Jeff and my influences in watershed restoration and permaculture and dryland restoration. And these are some of our primary influences and mentors in this field. Uh, in the top left, you can see uh, historic indigenous uh, rock structure. And th the indigenous peoples that worked with the natural processes are some of the, the primary developers of techniques like this. And so we want to make sure we acknowledge that this pra these practices have a long history of, of humans interacting with and learning, interacting with their watersheds and, and learning from nature and participating in the processes. Um, also, uh, Bill Zedike, who was a student of David Rosgen and Van Clothier wrote this book, Let the Water Do the Work, which is a, a phenomenal uh, tome that helps us understand how low tech erosion control can be applied, particularly to incised channels in, the, in arid regions. Uh, David Bainbridge, the Guide for Desert and Dryland Restoration. Uh, the Quivira Coalition has done a lot of work uh, with Bill Zedike and Watershed Artisans and, and many others to really uh, promote and expand the applications and exposure to low-tech eroding control, uh, particularly in New Mexico and uh, Southern Colorado. And then we're also uh, integrate things like beaver dam analogs, which are uh, stick and uh, twig structures that are built in, in creeks that are mimics of beaver dams and have been really promoted and uh, implemented by uh, Dr. Joe Wheaton and, and his colleagues. And then finally, uh, there's the Watershed Artisans and Craig Sponholtz is uh, one of our primary mentors and has really influenced our, our pathway through this. So, we have a basically a toolbox of techniques, strategies, and approaches that integrate with watershed restoration and property management to give you actionable techniques and other sorts of <clears throat> processes to work through applying low tech erosion to your land. And they these Different techniques can create improvements in drought resilience, water quality, water quantity, wildlife habitat, post wildfire stabilization, stormwater management, vegetation, health and vigor, as well as property protection. And so they really provide a, a wide array of benefits to the landscape when applied properly. So, <clears throat> one of the models that we use to really understand and apply low tech erosion control is the stream evolution triangle. And this model is kind of like a, a three-legged stool in that if you don't pay attention to one of the, the points on the triangle, then often it can um, undermine the effectiveness of your applications and, 
and efforts. So <clears throat> we use this tool both as a way to conceptualize the setting that we're in for applying these techniques, as well as for doing an assessment of the site. And then also it provides a checklist for you to utilize when you're doing your design and build to make sure that you're taking in the, the key concepts and applying them and make accounting for them in your process. So you can see in this image in the top left, the, the hydrology, the way the water's flowing through the landscape, and also the biology, the content of living plant materials that's actually covering the land. And the way those two things interact is, is very important. And you need to build your structures to balance both of those. On the top right, you can see that there's a fair amount of you know, green around the structure, brighter green, where the biology, the, the vegetation is really taking off from the implementation. And you can also see in the far right that the, the geology of this setting actually is a you know, dark brown, loose, unconfined sediment that doesn't really have any rock in it. So it's, it's very loose and very unstable. And so you really need to take that into account when you're building structures and making sure they're robust. And then finally, in, in the bottom, you can see kind of the intersections of the flow path, of the water coming down through a structure, and then also the, the geology and making sure that your paths that you choose for your hydrology are um, in tune with the, the geology and not just, for example, cutting away at the exposed bank. So balancing those three different features, the hydrology, the biology, and particularly the vegetation, but also the, the wildlife, and then the geology are, are very critical and, and useful for applying low tech erosion control. One of the, the simplest things that we can do from an erosion control standpoint is just to establish some soil cover. And that can be living vegetation, or it can be mulch, or it can even be rocks. Anything that protects the soil from the impact of raindrops and the exposure to the sun and the wind, the drying and baking and, and blowing forces that they create. And you can see here on the, on the left, the difference between poor litter cover and good litter cover. And on the right, they, there's been studies done looking at how much soil erosion occurs related to the percentage of soil cover. And even if you get, can, can get 40 to 60% soil cover, you get a dramatic exponential decrease in the uh, amount of erosion that occurs compared to zero or even 10% soil cover. So soil cover is, is a very valuable and fairly easy and effective tool to apply for low-tech erosion control. Another tool and model that we use is the soil erosion triangle, which was developed by Brad Lancaster. And this has the, at the three points of the triangle, the three factors uh, that, of water that really influence erosion. It's the depth of water, the speed of water, and the volume of water. And if any of those increase, then the potential and the extent of erosion also increases. And so what we can do is we, anything that we can do to decrease any one of those will decrease the amount of erosion and increase the amount of water that's soaking into the landscape and rehydrating the soils and providing water for vegetation, vegetation to grow. So uh, generally that's either spreading the water, slowing the water or sinking the water. So any techniques that we can do to, to achieve any of those three will generally start to break the soil erosion triangle and start to increase the water retention potential of the landscape. Another model that we like that was developed by Craig Sponholz of Watershed Artisans is the stages of gully development. And this is particularly valuable to use and understand because it provides us a model of how erosion interacts with different soil layers. And it also provides a guide for us for where to apply our low tech erosion control so that they can be most effective and so that we can identify priority treatment areas and locations in the landscape. And what I'd like to point out in particular is that by the time you get to stage six, where you have this deep eroded gully, that's the thing that most easily attracts your eye and seems like it needs the most attention, but it doesn't really have any topsoil left and it's mostly subsoil and bedrock and it's steep and it doesn't have any vegetation. So usually it's the most difficult place to get really good effects from low tech erosion control. So you have to put in the most effort for the least amount of return in a setting like this. Whereas if we can catch the stages of erosion and gully development at sheet erosion or pedestal formation, where there's just a little bit of a gully forming or a rill forming even, and a little bit of head cutting and incision taking place, then those are fairly easy to treat and uh, also low risk. And you can get the best return on your investment from, from those treatments and those stages of gully formation and the development because it's fairly flat. There's still topsoil and vegetation present. 
And so you can really get a, a, a big benefit, a big bang for your buck when you apply these techniques in, in settings such as sheet erosion, pedestal formation, and even rill formation. So those are often areas to, to focus on. Rather than the thing that looks like it needs the most work, try to find the areas that are doing pretty good, but kind of in danger and starting to degrade and, and work there first because you can get the best return. And with that, I will hand it off to Jeff to explain what LTech looks like in action. Awesome. Thank you, Neil. Thanks, Javin. And uh, so excited to see everybody on the uh, on the call here. Um, I'm going to jump into what does a load LTech look like in action? And uh, let me just get this slide going here. And so it really looks like a lot of different things. I think with, you know, anybody that's been involved in permaculture or land management really knows that it depends. And so the context that you're working in is really going to clue you into what types of materials and what types of structures may be most appropriate for your specific situation. And so there's certain pieces that we're always, always looking for sort of like where in that gully development stage are you like Neil just went over because that's going to inform whether you're building a structure to further spread flows or whether you're trying to stabilize a head cut or protect a certain piece of infrastructure. So really cueing in to your site assessment of where are you in the system? Where are you in the landscape? How active is the erosion? What sort of materials do you have? Answering those sorts of questions and asking those sorts of questions can really help guide your decision on what to do. And so the the picture on the left here is um, outside of Moab, Utah. That's a case where we've got a channel starting to come off of a, um, a road that was put in and we wanna just keep fanning that water out, spreading it out. So we used a technique called the media luna or the half moon that intercepts concentrated flow, spreads it out evenly over a level rock sill and returns it to sheet flow so that it has a higher chance of soaking into the landscape and rehydrating a bigger area. Picture on the right, very different system. This is in the uh, high mountain meadow up in, in New Mexico. And this was multiple head cuts just cutting through this, this wet meadow, wetland, slope wetland. And it needed a different technique to stabilize those flow paths to get the water from point A to point B um, to reverse or stop that erosion from occurring. And so the real summary of what does it look like is that it's got to be field fit to your site conditions. So the different manuals and books give us guidance on what the structures can look like and in some cases should look like, but then there's also a lot of room for creativity and innovation in how you fit these structures into your specific landscape and how you can utilize different materials and different techniques concurrently to form hybrid structures and treatment trains. So here we've got the before is um, essentially all the water flow was intercepted by a path that then started to head cut and gully. Very, very common stressor in our landscapes are roads and paths that sort of break up flow, start running it down, down the pathway, and then that increases the volume and velocity typically of the water, which gives it more erosive power and things start to unravel. So in this case, we, um, we actually filled the head cut because it was part of the path system and we used a technique we call brush mineral structures where we're essentially layering organic debris with a mix of mineral earth and wood chips and packing it all together and getting it up to the grade we want so that that acts as a deflector, kind of a berm, if you will, that then pushes that water into a stabilized channel system where we modeled this one um, after what's considered like a step pool, a series of cascades to help that water get down the, the two and a half, three foot drop. And we crisscrossed logs, Russian olive and some other invasive species that were being removed out of a different project crisscrossed those, packed them in with the mix, we call them dirty chips, with just a mix wood chips and, and mineral earth together. And then we did some strategic rock armoring to, to uh, 
button it all together and really get that extra stability at those key flow points and splash points. And then in the kind of upper middle is a media luna. So trying to slow and spread the flows before it gets to this steeper transition point. So the steepness of your site is really also going to inform, you know, what type of structures and how robust you need to build them. So then we had the pleasure of having it put to a test. We had actually back to back hundred year storm events that just bombed down the canyon, um, flowed out. And here you can see the after shot. You can see where the water was coming in. It spread across the width of here, deposited sediment up uphill of the upgradient of the Media Luna. And then it splashed down as designed through these step pools, leaving some sediment deposition. And it really worked great. And um, and it's just cool to see it in action. And we actually had the opportunity to go back and put another course on this. So these these LTEX, these they're really not one and done. They're meant to be put in, see them get get put to the test, and then be out there inspecting it, maintaining it, tweaking it. And when needed, when they function properly and they fill with sediment, that's the time to then add another lift of rocks or materials on top of that if you have further um, further area to a grade and catch those sediments. And so as we think about fitting these to our specific site context, there's certain um, design considerations or what we call the anatomy of common low-tech erosion control structures. And um, we go into all of these in a lot more detail in the course. And I just want to like highlight them all here for you now is that we're really looking at what's your flow path? How wide, how deep is it sheet flow? Is it in a gully? You know, what is it coming off a roof? What's, what's your flow path that you're dealing with so that we can use that as the basis to make sure we're maintaining or increasing our cross-sectional area. And that's sort of like plan view, you look at it. If the water's coming out this wide, we don't want to constrict it and make it deeper. If anything, we want to make it wider and shallower. And then we want to always be thinking about our critical elevations. How do we make sure that we provide the water with a very consistent and clear flow path so that it doesn't choose the low point and potentially wrap around and erode out the side of our structure? And also to make sure we don't back up water up against a building or a tree or some piece of infrastructure that we want to protect. So looking at those critical elevations is a is a key piece of how to design and fit these into place. And then we want to look at the sides. We want to look at angles of repose and slopes, because if you get to a certain steepness, then we're really going to want to do some level of armoring or stabilization. And so paying attention to if you're digging a basin or you're adding um, a structure, like thinking about how steep you're making it and deciding if that's going to be stable as is or need a little extra work. Thinking about the wetted area, how far and wide are we spreading water as we pool it up on the up gradient side of our structure? What are we wetting? How, how can we maximize that wetted area? And then always planning for an overflow. I like to say, if you don't give water a place to go, it'll find the weak point and you very well may not like what it decides to do. And so we wanna always think about where one structure flows to the next, flows to the next until you get it to a point where it's either off your project site, off your property, or can return to a natural stable channel. Um, thinking about edges and transitions, these are often weak points in the system where your solid rocks come up against the unconsolidated soils of the bank. So we really wanna hone in on, on those edges and transitions, upgrading and downgrading and the sides of our structures and make sure it's integrated well into the, the surrounding landscape. And then we're really looking at material size and type. So sometimes it might, a project might warrant an engineer design to say you need this size rock. A lot of times if you observe and see what particle sizes are moving in the system, you can select stuff that's bigger than what your specific flows are moving and use those so that you make sure you're using stuff that's solid enough that it doesn't get blown out in a big flood event, um, which really is kind of the idea of armoring is like getting some rock or something solid, especially on those edges and transitions to make sure your structure is really solid. And that kind of ties in with the tightness and the space filling. You want to avoid what's called piping where the water is flowing 
through your structure, like through and under the rocks rather than over it. So often we'll use some sort of coarse gravel and stuff and pack it in real good so that we get that nice tight seal so the water can, um, can go over it and it can remain stable. And like I've been alluding to, all this stuff is done in treatment trains. It's, it's really not one structure here, one structure there, but thinking in terms of complexes of structures and treatment trains so that one feeds into the next, into the next, so that we can maximize the beneficial relationships of all those structures working in unison. So I'm just gonna jump over to a couple case studies to just give you some real life examples of um, specific applications. And so what works for this site may or may not be appropriate for, for your site, but just to give an idea of what some real life examples look like. This is a property outside of Moab that experienced major sediment deposition flooding um, from some recent storms. So here's a map of the flow paths. And essentially this is a multi-property issue because there's several properties upgradient of this one that did not manage their stormwater and their sediment appropriately. So it all came down onto my client's property. And unfortunately, some of the upgradient property owners chose that they didn't want to do anything, not my problem. So we were tasked with, you know, fixing it and making sure that we're protecting this this house in a way that also integrates with the natural landscape. And so the blue is all the different gullies that formed in these storms. And the orange is the, the plume of sediment six to 12 inches deep over the entire back patio. So here's what we came up with for a design. We figured that we had to reroute water around the property in a way that put it back into some of the natural drainages that were there and really gave the client a sense of security and stability. And so the blue is the, the new design lines. Um, one of the key features is this kind of horseshoe perimeter berm. And that essentially was like two to three foot high, make sure that water moves around. And then we stabilized those flow paths with a series of Rock made the Alunas used some rock rundowns, which are kind of like rock staircases, if you will, and uh, built in a lot of redundancy so that we've kind of created some new sub watersheds of this site by parting the waters around the house and then had secondary structures inside this perimeter berm to further direct any direct, um, direct rainfall around the property so that there wouldn't be such a mess on the back patio. And so here it is after completion, you can see the, the tan here is the, the perimeter berm. Um, in this case, we worked around, we didn't have to remove any of the juniper trees. We did, um, we did lose a couple of shrubs in the process that it was just necessary to make these structures robust enough, but we got the perimeter berm in. We shaped up this channel um, and put in a series of about a dozen um, rock structures to slow the flow, pool it up at every stage. We put a native seed mix under all of these. So with the rains, as they catch that sediment and hold that moisture, we've got some vegetation popping up to help provide some longer term stability and get that roots, photosynthesis, all those beneficial ecosystem processes going. And then we've got the the secondary rock structures and, um, and berms on the interior of the, of the larger berm to further slow flows and bring them around safely around the property. And then if all of that isn't enough, we also pushed back the hillside, built a retaining wall and uh, a rock retaining wall and then put in a, a swale. So coming up closer, this is looking, you see the little inset from the top. This is looking at the top of the property down. Um, here's the, the client's house and you can see these, these uh, gullies just forming. And um, part of the issue is the house was built on an alluvial fan, which by definition is where water braids and moves around. And so it was just unfortunate that the house was built there and they didn't put adequate drainage control in at the time of building. So we had to, to come back in and retrofit after, after these floods. But there's the before shot. You can see the water kind of taking a turn for the house. And then uh, here's the after shot where we've got the, the perimeter berm in the foreground. That's a mix of our dirty chips. So our, our 
about 50% wood chips and 50% mineral earth mixed together. They mat together really good, become a really stable um, structure. But then because we've got the big flows coming down, we also rock armored it so that over time as it gets hit by subsequent runoff events that we don't have any erosion and undermining of our berm. And then we, you can see the series of these rock media lunas going down the new flow path and each of them is shaped so that they've got a little bit of pooling capacity and that they spread the flow out as wide as possible within the topography of the site. So here's a different view. This is kind of looking up, up gradient towards that same area. You can see the, the berm with the rocks and the, the uh, media lunas on the right and then some of the interior structures on the left and then we also heavily mulched everything so that we left as minimal amounts of bare soil as possible going back to that soil cover chart that Neil showed we really wanted to make sure that we're handling the direct rainfall and the runoff from all of the, the houses and, and lands up above and uh, if you look close you'll see this rock spillway that's actually a detention pond which um, blew out during during these storm events so it actually breached on the left side and overtopped and gullied so it's just this kind of compounding issue of a lot of mismanaged water going over loose unconsolidated soils and ended up on somebody's back patio um, here's a shot of the driveway which essentially became um, for a reference, this uh, in the foreground, this sediment plume, that's a really good example of what an alluvial fan does. It happens when you come out of a confined channel and it spreads out and it leaves kind of like a triangular delta fan shape of sediment. And then the flow path can kind of braid across that. So really good thing to have in a natural landscape and to work with, not the type of thing you want teeing into your house. So we worked with this and it turned into our final outflow of the berm and, and channel system. Comes down this nice rock rundown that kind of splashes, dissipates that energy, and then it can move across the, the driveway. And there's a little swale here on the side to help bring that water down and around the driveway. And um, always thinking about integrated functions we also, this um, step pool that's the final overflow from the upland drainage system is also a staircase that helps to improve site access for the client. And then that berm that I showed is now a trail so the client can walk around the whole property with ease and it's really clear where people go and it's clear where the water can go as well. Um, very different scale. Here's a uh, more, more urban suburban project in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. They'd taken some steps. They got this roof catchment system, but then you can see the whole driveway is just sheeting across. You can start to see it sort of forming these little rivulets, and then it goes over the edge to the neighbors, and it was just eroding out the fence line, taking a lot of soil, putting it on the neighbor's field. So not good in any, any case. So we, we redesigned it so that we've got sheet flow now coming off of the driveway. And it can just cross here and go into these basins um, that have some rock spillways. And then we took the overflow of the roof tank, roof catchment tank, and also put it into that system. So now all this water can go and feed this um, this perimeter planting. It's been uh, populated with native plantings and functioning great. Looks great. Took advantage of a sort of marginalized, underutilized space and turned it into a piece of natural infrastructure that has site improvement benefits. Um, and then there, there's an up close where you can start to really see some of that anatomy of these structures. So we've got the cross-sectional area, we've got the edges tied up on the banks nice and high so that we're making sure that any water flow comes stable across these rocks. And uh, we were also in, able to integrate some logs, some larger aesthetic rocks, and then uh, put in a nice mix of plantings. And so, as I mentioned earlier, like this isn't a, a passive kind of do it and forget it. It really works best when you can get out there and see how it works. And so here's a, a rock structure that was built in Northern New Mexico, and it got hit by some storms. You can see it's caught a bunch of sediment. It's 
knocked over a little bit of the vegetation. And now there's not much height left on those rocks because they've worked, they've caught the sediment, they've slowed the flows, they've spread it out. And this would be a time where we would ideally be able to go back and add another rock structure upgradient of this that uses the first rock structure as the splash apron. So we can kind of keep building up on those. And it's also oftentimes we see that we could always generally add more structures. And so that's part of that interactive piece of this or go out, observe it, see what's working, see what's not and fix it or add to it or modify things so that we can keep helping these structures to work better and better. And one of the ways we can track this over time, real simple monitoring technique is repeat photography. Just picking a spot, getting your before photos as built, and then going back in subsequent years to see how your structures are progressing, see what's working um, and track those changes over time. So that's really nice, you know, picture says a thousand words. And once you can like see it and show people and say, hey, look, we just built these hand-built structures and they had this positive effect on the watershed. Let's go do some more. It can be a really powerful way to build community buy-in, track your results over time and celebrate the successes of these types of techniques. And uh, so with that, I will turn it back over to Neil. Thanks, Jeff. So uh, in our course, we've developed a model for the LTEC project process. It's an iterative model based on the adaptive management process where you have four stages, the assess stage, the design stage, the build stage, and the maintain stage, and maintain and monitor. And these four stages repeat because, as Jeff mentioned, it's often that you you build some structures and then you come back and you maintain them after a, a large storm event or after a year. And also through that, you're assessing if there's an opportunity to design and build more structures to continue to improve the hydrology of the site and to mitigate any erosion that's going on. And each of these stages has a, a deep set of detailed co components that we've developed along with checklists and, and guidelines for um, each section. So for some of the examples uh, would be, uh, we want to assess where we are in the landscape. We wanna understand the topo topography of the landscape and our landscape position, because the hydrology and water flow always follows the topography since water moves perpendicular to contour. And we wanna understand if we're at the top of the watershed in something like the collection zone uh, or in a steep section of the watershed, the transport zone, or if we're down in the alluvial fans and channelized flow zones and deposition zones, because we use different techniques in each area and each area has a, a different set of opportunities and uh, potential for restoration, erosion control and water management. And, and this model here was developed by Craig Sponholtz. It really helps us to conceptualize uh, where we might integrate our activities and how to create treatment trains and choose different structure types. Uh, another thing that we do as part of our assessment uh, is a remote assessment looking at the watershed and the topography and the, the slopes. And so you can see here on the left is a, a site with uh, the different watersheds that, that flow into the site mapped and their sizes as well as their land use. And if we can understand the land use, then that will also help us understand the types of water flows and the types and amount of sediment that might be coming down through the site as well as some of the wildlife and, and vegetation that might come through the site. So understanding that both the size of the watershed as well as the, the cover of the watershed and the land use. So this watershed, for example, uh, is primarily wildlands with a, a fair amount of bare soil. So it will have you know, a significant amount of flash runoff, but it, it's not uh, a development or a set of farms or, or things like that where you might have other sorts of uh, runoff uh, with different amounts of sediment, you know, development will probably have lower quantities of sediment with more hard surfaces and flashy runoff, whereas, you know, something like a lot of uh, farmland, especially tilled farmland, might have larger quantities of sediment as well as chemicals that you might want to consider. 
uh, in, your, in your design for your site. And then on the right, you can see this is a more detailed uh, topographic map where uh, I mapped out the ridges and the valleys on the site, as well as uh, the, the valleys being the water flow lines. And then we've also integrated a, a detailed slope map that uh, categorizes the slopes into different percentages, which allows us to understand the locations where we'll have the highest potential to uh, in, infiltrate and spread and slow and sink water, as well as areas that are easy to work. And then some of the areas where we'll have a low potential for, for treatments, but um, we'll have flash runoff or other contributions to the, the hydrology of the site. So a slope map helps us to guide our, our selections of treatment types and prioritize locations for where we might do treatments on the site. And we can do all this from a remote assessment and then use that to inform our site visit and where we really are looking and focus our investigations on the site. So some common functions of LTEC treatments that we integrate when we're starting to do a design are we're looking at stabilizing an area. So erosion is by nature unstable. It's often creating something like a head cut or an incision, which is cutting down into the soil, uh, exposing bare soil, speeding up the water, making the flow path steeper, and basically carrying water and sediment off of the site faster and faster, dehydrating the site, uh, which decreases the amount of water that is retained for vegetation and wildlife. So for areas that we might look to stabilize are things like head cuts, which a head cut is a, a steep pour over that is incising or, or down cutting into the landscape and it works its way up the, the landscape. So stabilizing a head cut causes, creates some vertical stability, which is very valuable. Um, we might wanna stabilize a low energy channel or flow path. So this could be something like not a, a stream or a creek, but just uh, a small rill that's moving through the site or something like a pathway, like what Jeff showed earlier, where it's a stressor that's caught the water and channelized it. Uh, and we can use things like grade controls or stabilizing the banks of streams sometimes we'll wanna do. Also stabilizing slopes. Uh, in steeper slopes tend to be less stable and a lot of times just getting mulch or vegetation on them can work. Other times we need armoring or other structures. And then stabilizing soils and vegetation, uh, which can be very valuable because by stabilizing the topsoil on the site and vegetation on the site, it can continue to grow more vegetation and, and increase stability and regenerate the site. And then finally, we might look at deterring ungulates uh, such as uh, domestic livestock, cattle and sheep, or things like elk or deer or other sorts of large animals that can degrade landscapes either by um, digging holes or their hoof action or creating trails or other sorts of, put other sorts of stressors on the site. Other, another function that we might look at doing is altering the flow paths of the water. And it's particularly if it's degraded and the water is all concentrated into a gully or a rill, we might look at slowing and infiltrating the water, uh, spreading it out, spreading that flow out, or concentrating the flow sometimes. Sometimes we really need to look at taking water and concentrating it, particularly if we're looking at diverting it around some a degraded area or a building or some sort of critical infrastructure. And when we concentrate those flows, we often are looking at how we um, are then stabilizing it as well. And the, another thing we might do is we might split the flows of the water and, and spread water out over a, a wider area or return flow to an abandoned floodplain or a wetland or something like that. But also maintaining some flow down the existing channel to maintain the hydrology and the vegetation in that existing channel. Uh, and we, we want to manage the flow of sediment because anytime water is moving through landscape, sediment is also moving with it. To some degree and in arid areas uh, often sediment is a large portion of what's moving with the water uh, and large quantities move and then the the final thing which is kind of the the best end result and all the structures tend to try to work on doing that is to grow more desired vegetation and you know the that's any vegetation in my opinion is better than no vegetation um, but the desired vegetation is the ultimate goal and as Jeff mentioned before, typically our structures are implemented in treatment trains, meaning that there's multiple different structures that are integrated along the flow path of water to create multiple functions, spread the water out in the landscape, slow and catch sediment, and grow more vegetation.
<laughs> so here's an example of stabilizing a, a slope. And this is a project that Jeff did where he built these uh, brush mineral structures with uh, sticks, a lot of them used from um, invasive species removal, and then a uh, mix of about 50% mineral earth and 50% wood chips, and really packed tightly together to create these terraces, which are stabilizing what was once just a, a cut slope hillside, hillside, which had no way to stabilize itself and would continue to erode. And then these were also built around existing vegetation to both improve the health of that vegetation and use that vegetation to increase the stability of the, the slope and provide seed for more vegetation to fill in on these terraces. Here's an example of altering flow paths where we're both spreading the flow and splitting the flow. So um, Aaron here is standing on the structure that we built, which is a, a log mat, uh, as well as a, a flows into a log step down, which stabilized an existing head cut in a wet meadow. And it made, as you can see, the, the shape of this log mat is a kind of a dish or a U shape, uh, similar to the channel shape. And what it allowed the water to do is continue to flow down the existing flow path and keep these wet meadows hydrated so that they are continuing to grow and stabilize the existing flow path, as well as split a portion of the flow and spread it out across uh, historic floodplain of a slope wetland and rehydrate that whole slope wetland, which had uh, degraded since the channel, uh, it had channelized and incised, and what used to be the wetland had turned into upland with more dryland and upland grasses. So the splitting of the flows will hopefully spread the extent of the wetland and the wetted area and reestablish the wetland plants in the historic wetland, as well as maintain the wetland that exists in a slightly degraded state. And then here's an example of a treatment train uh, where we have both head cut stabilization up near the top of the slide where the people are working uh, with um, some log step downs as well as rock mulch rundowns, which are spreading out the flows. And then once we get down from the, the main head cut that's incising this slope wetland, uh, we have channelized flow and we have two grade control structures, which are log mats, which have been beefed up with some rock armoring and also uh, gravel fill to really make the water flow over them and fill in the structures. And you can see the ponding. And these log, log mat grade controls are built at the crossovers. So the, the channel is coming down and it's in a straight section here, the, the crossover and it starts its new turn. And then it straightens out and it starts a new turn going off the screen. And these, these log mats are creating both uh, increasing and in, uh, grading the channel and they're pooling water behind them. And they're also stabilizing the channel so that it, it can, when, uh, when floodwaters occur, the water can spread out and access the floodplains and rehydrate those and increase the wetted perimeter and grow more vegetation. And so all of these work together because the grade controls also protect the up gradient structures, the rock mulch rundown and the log step down uh, from any other head cuts that might be moving up the stream. And they, they give it a chance to, uh, they give, the managers a chance to come and inspect them and treat any head cuts prior to endangering the major alluvial fan and slope wetland up, up gradient. So they're all working together to slow and spread water, increase wetted perimeter, as well as to protect and make each structure more resilient. And finally, I'd like to end on a note of community collaboration because these sorts of structures and systems really benefit from working together as a community both a community of professionals working with uh, restorationists and agency folks, contractors, educators, and nonprofits, as well as engaging the community. And you can see here, this is a, a great, uh, this is at a Quivir Coalition workshop, and it's a great example of how many people can uh, make the work much easier, you know, just by creating a, a train to hand, a chain or a train to hand the rocks from the truck down into the structure site rather than one person or two people having to carry them all down or pushing them with the machine. So this way everyone gets to participate and it makes the work easier and also more fun. And everyone can celebrate the watershed and work together and uh, improve its value as, as, a, as a community. And so these outreach events are, are really valuable to, to have. And I'm grateful that Quivira Coalition has really put together a lot of them over the years. Um, and this is actually how I was able to start my journey into 
LTEC and watershed restoration was by participating in some of these uh, hands-on volunteer workshops. So the community piece is, is very valuable, and we're really doing this to improve the watershed for the, the whole community because everyone participates in the water cycle, whether they do it actively or not. So on, on that note, I would like to thank you all for, for joining us. And um, I wish everyone a great LTEC adventure. I'll hand it off to Javin. Thanks so much, Neil. Thanks so much, Jeffrey. I, I'm always just so astounded at how erosion can be deftly handled with simple materials that can be found in and around the area or within a stone's throw when you start to interact with the different community members that are there. And I know you've both spoken about this at length, but so much about this is about community and connecting with people. And we've got some great questions coming up about that community conversation. Folks are already chiming in, very insightful presentation. Thank you for sharing, great refresher. Thank you so much, guys. One of the major questions that is coming up is, will there be a recording of this webinar. Yes, indeed, there will be. I will be sending the link out to everybody uh, shortly after this presentation. If you do have any questions, we're going to be getting to our Q&A very shortly here. So make sure to go into the Q&A section there. And Neil and Jeff, if there are any questions you feel you gents can answer via text, feel free to go to the Q&A section and uh, feel free to be answering them. That'll help to take care of our question load when we come to our live component. More people are coming in. Amazing presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, I wish more humans would be doing this. Uh, thank you for all the great examples. Wonderful. So folks, I want to take a moment and just talk a little bit about why we're here and how we actually ended up in this conversation. So one of the things that few people know or understand is that if there's a bunch of individuals that are thinking about a conversation, not much happens. Uh, action without thought is a nightmare and thought without action is a daydream. But when you start to put people into application, when you really start to have people say, no, I wanna take a stand, I wanna do something, change happens exponentially. I've been involved in this sphere of work since 2009. And in 2020, I decided it was time to start to offer practical skills to live on the planet as if we intend to stay without any sort of ideology attached to it. No isms, no ologies, no altars, just, skills, just practical skills with practiced, seasoned individuals who'd been doing their craft for years. And that's how regenerative living dot online came to be. It was a conversation of how do we bring some of the best practices and the most experienced individuals to talk about this and help people do it without having to leave the comfort of their own home. And so with that, we've had a number of exceptional courses, LTech erosion control, low tech erosion control, a self-paced course, We've got some food forestry courses on there. We have an amazing course with Coppice Agroforestry, Mark Krawcheck, who recently just wrote in a brilliant book about that, designing and integrating multifunctional hedgerows, eating well with chef Seth Peterson, talking about how do we bring that bounty into our kitchens and into our bodies. Family food security with Kakasimo Esquith, an incredible Métis woman who has food security down to a science. You can put in how much of your food you you and your family eat into a spreadsheet. It'll produce the linear row feet. It'll basically design your garden for you. And we walk through how to, to gather and work with that food. We have a great course about pawpaw uh, growing, which is an incredible uh, temperate to tropical plant. We have propagating woody edibles, rainwater harvesting and design and composting toilets. The course roster and catalog is growing exponentially every year. And coming up, we have a biogas course, soil fundamentals course, working in uh, interacting with living soils. There's just an incredible array. So my question to all of you now is, you know, do you want to stop erosion? Is this something that you're actively wanting to do on your land, in your business? Is it something you want to create with your toolkit? And if so, do you want to learn and design with these low-tech erosion controls? Is that something that motivates you? Because you kind of have two options. You can do option one, which is trial and error. You can you can read a book, you can uh, operate from a conversation of I'm going to see and, and observe, which is a wonderful way to do it. Or you can have simple strategic systems, systems that individuals like Neil and Jeff over their past decades of work have honed and worked in through not necessarily a recipe, but a process, a way to take a look at any ecology and decode that ecology and come to a place of understanding about what to do and when to do it. 
This course, this low-tech erosion control course has 14 hours of class presentations. It has four hours of Q&A, 50 plus curated resources and four checklists to help guide you to go through and make the right moves. There's this old conversation that we all learn from mistakes. They just don't have to be your own. And Neil and Jeff, very humble folks, they've shared their mistakes, they've shared their successes, and it's all there for you right in the course. But better than me telling you, let me show you what that looks like. Let me show you what the course looks like and what that might look like for you. Again, we've got a uh, draw for three spots in the course that's coming up. So anybody who is currently in the webinar will have a chance to win three spots in the low-tech erosion control course. So great to stick around. So what this low-tech erosion control course looks like if you go to the landing page is we've got not only a short summary of the course, but you'll also see why this course, what it's about, why we need it, what the erosion is about. We've got a previous webinar, an ex explanation of all the different modules. And this is what I really want to show everybody. You don't have to take the course. I'm not telling you you should. I'm saying if the course solves a problem in your life in terms of building a toolbox or building more tools in that toolbox in terms of stopping erosion, or if it helps you to further design or develop implementations on your own land or the land you manage, then it's a great resource. But if it's just not the right time for you, there are so many resources on this landing page, including all of these case studies that Jeff, Neil, and I went through a couple of years ago. So if you wanna see even more case studies coming off of this webinar, we have a number of different elements there. You'll also get a chance to see and take a look further into their bios. And again, we have a second set of case studies. So again, I'm not saying buy the course, but if it works for you, if it actually solves the problem, then do so. When you jump into the course, what you'll see is we have all of these seven different modules on the left-hand side. And then within each module, we have a section objective. So we're really focused on pedagogy. It's not just, here's what it is, good luck to trying. Here's the session objectives. What are we trying to get you to understand? Then we have uh, the two-hour presentation that Neil and Jeff presented. And then we have the assignment and resources section. Now. One thing that you always want to understand from a course is, will I have enough resources to come back to? Is it just your presentations? And I have to say, this is one of the most resourced courses we've put together. In it, we have both the PDFs of all the presentations and also the chat log from the presentations that happened because this happened with a live group of over 80 students. And then we have the module resources. Now, Neil and Jeff put together the module reference master list, which has every single resource they came to and thought of and put together, but that's also curated for every single one of your ass assignment modules. Then they also have a module assignments to walk you through how to think about and start to develop your designer's mind around LTech. And if that wasn't enough, we also have suggested readings and suggested videos that you can come back to over and over and over again. There is so much to this course that when a colleague of mine took a look at it, because we're always bringing in new instructors, always having new conversations come up, they they thought that uh, Neil and Jeff must have had a small team that put it together, but no, it was just the two of them. What do folks think about this course? Well, as folks have said, this is cutting edge. This is so fantastic. I feel like I leveled up my design skills. Thank you so much. This was incredible, generous to share so much of your expertise. Thank you too for the wealth of conversation and information. It's such a comprehensive course. And I think that's one of the things that I've loved about Neil and Jeff is they put so much effort into this comprehensive course. So when you walk away, you'll feel comfortable with understanding the how and why and when to design and apply low-tech erosion controls. Neil and Jeff will walk you step-by-step step through every process to design and implement these structures. You'll feel clear, you'll feel confident, and you'll be ready to start your own projects. And there's a certain type of joy that comes from knowing how to turn eroded, dry, and dusty ground into lush landscapes, which is exactly what you'll have at the end of this course. So normally, the self-paced version, the on-demand version of this course is $179. But until this Sunday, so this Sunday, just four days away, until Sunday at midnight on June 11th, 2023, the course is $129.
And one of the things that the students have said about this course and why they like it so much is that it's a resource. It's kind of like the biggest book on low-tech erosion controls that you could have that's on your shelf that you'll have lifetime access to that you can come back to at any time. So this may not be the opportune time for you. You may not have a project coming up or you may not have a project on your landscape that you want to work with. But if you think at any point in the future, this is something you want to have access to, this would be an opportune time for the next four days to have access to this course that you can come to, reference, come to at any time. The other thing that's amazing is that anybody who's enrolled in the low-tech erosion control self-paced on-demand course will have access to a low price when we offer the live version again in 2024. So it's another way to get access to one of the lowest prices we'll ever offer this course for. Thanks everybody. I'm, I'm really excited to share that with folks. And I hope if it's a, an option for folks that folks will, will jump into it and get excited by. I saw uh, just a comment there that it's not just about joy, but survival. And one of the things that Neil and Jeff go into is really about how to do these in such a way so that way we're not dealing with erosion in and around our areas. So thank you everybody for, for taking a moment to take a look at that course. We're gonna jump into our Q&A here right away. But uh, first, we've got our first draw, our first draw. So um, when uh, we got a question here, when would be the in-person course in 2024? Great question, Ruth. I believe, Neil and Jeff, you can, you can correct me, but I think we're going to be starting in February or March of 2024. Do you guys remember when that course is being slated? Uh, late, late January through the beginning of March. Late, late January towards the beginning of March. Yes. All right, so our very first winner of the LTech low-tech uh, low erosion control course is Jose Noel Alvarez. So Jose, if you can email me at javin at allpointsdesign.ca, that's javin at allpointsdesign.ca to claim that, uh, that, that, uh, that registration for low tech, that would be fantastic. And uh, if I could just get the assistant to put my email into the chat, that would be fantastic. We'll do another draw for another winner um, into, the, uh, into the middle of the Q&A. Thanks so much. Thanks, Jose. All right. So our first question, gents, is uh, from Nick. Uh, is from Nick. Uh, sorry, everybody. I'll just put my, my email on there. It's javin at allpointsdesign.ca. There you go, Jose. Feel free to email me to claim that. All right, first one is from Nick. Uh, so from Nick, uh, in the river we have in my land, the local government gets in every few years with a huge bulldozer and cleans all vegetation in order for the water to flow faster and avoid floods. The depth of the river has increased by three meter in 30 years. How can I reverse that? The width of the river now that it's been deepened is about four meters. While it flows through the year, most of the water is flowing during the heavy rain uh, events and when the snow melts in spring. Neil or Jeff, either of you wanna uh, tackle that one? Yeah, I think um, a lot of this stuff, the higher in the watershed we can start, the better. So it, it's sounding to me like there's probably a, a pretty good amount of catchment area that's probably not managing the water effectively so that by the time it gets down to the, the creek or the, the river itself, it's just chugging through. And so if possible, I know there's property ownership and like those sorts of issues to work through, but anything that can be done to slow the flow and hold water and sediment on in the upper watersheds will really help take some of the strain off of, off of the, the lower area um, and the river. Um, then I think the next piece of this is that it's probably going to be working with the local government because they have a, they have a valid concern. They may just not be approaching it holistically of how to keep people safe from flooding. And so that, that's an issue in a lot of areas. There is the tendency that just get the water out of here, get the channel clear to, to move it along. Um, so that conversation to see about what their management um, practices are and what some other strategies to alleviate that concern might be. Um, 
assuming you could work in the in that section of river itself um some of the structures like one rock dams could be really great at catching sediment and helping to aggrade the channel back up um it also may be if we think back to that stream evolution and uh the gully formation one of the processes that happens is once a river or creek has down cut sometimes it's not practical to get it back up to the original floodplain level but as that channel widens there may be opportunities to induce meandering and create a new inset floodplain within the gully channel so that we can at least get some of the functionality even if it's not the ideal back to fully going out on the floodplain, which I'm guessing has probably been partially or fully developed. And that's why they're trying to move the water through there. So that's maybe some quick, I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that, Neil. Yeah, I, I agree, you know, treating the upper watershed. And then uh, so another structure that might be appropriate is something like a, a Zuni bowl or some sort of log step down at any location where there's some vertical instability, because if you have vertical instability in the channel, which means down cutting and active incision and a head cut, then it's hard to get the channel to widen because it, it continues to cut deeper. So the widening happens after you achieve horizontal or, or vertical stability and you get horizontal instability. Um, and so that, that's kind of the order of operations is looking to create vertical stability and the grade control structures do that as well. And then um, ideally some sort of induced meandering, um, which you know Bill Zedike's book goes through in, in detail. And that includes uh, other structures, which we, we haven't covered here, things like baffles that deflect the water into cut banks and create point bars and stuff like that, which is a, a fair amount more technical than just things like uh, Zuni bowls and, and one rock dam. So you could start with at least the, the grade control, which will help retain the water and, and go from there. Awesome. Thanks, gentlemen. Thank you so much. That's uh, that's a great answer and really takes a look at the bigger conversation. Really appreciate that. A couple of people saying they got a head out and they really enjoyed the presentation. Thank you so much. That's fantastic. Um, so from an, uh, an anonymous attendee, how, how do you place the rocks so they stay put? How do you make sure that they're not going to move around when there is water flow? Yeah, that's a great question. So the first, the two part answer, maybe there are more parts than that, but the first part of the answer is making sure that you use rocks that are big enough to withstand the flows. So that's that's a key part, but then it's also how you build the structure. So most of these like media lunas and one rock dams, we start with trenching in the footer rocks that are also the splash apron. So on the down gradient side, you want to embed some, some rocks that are pretty much flush with the down gradient side so that water spills over, lands on them. And then you build the structure from the bottom up, placing each successive course of rocks up against that footer rock. And it's usually the footer rock and the first course of rocks are partially dug into the the channel bank and then from there we can kind of go on surface and backfill a little bit to bed them in good so it's big enough material get a good stable footer build from the bottom up and do what's called a running bond if you look at um bricks you know the the seams are always alternating and so we want to do that with the rocks too so that we don't have big gaps through them um, and then that also becomes the the side slope. So I usually go build from the bottom up and build from the center out so that you can really place each rock so it's snug and stable against the ones below it. And then the center ones help you work your way out to create the channel shape that you need for your, your specific situation. Awesome. Thank you so much. Next question. Uh, since we are on a volcano, we have lahars which can be significant i'm not sure what that is threatening major infrastructure such as railroad lines highways and roads i'm interested in working with other organizations agencies and corporations which have stake in restoration how might we develop some round table discussions to bring government and private parties to the restoration table i 
Yeah, great question. I think um, it all starts with the conversation and, um, you know, finding who the who the right people are, who the right stakeholders are, and having a conversation with them. And it's I've found it really helpful before starting the conversation, or at least in the early phases of the conversation, is to really try to understand what their needs, issues, concerns are, and really kind of approach it from the angle of, you know, try to get in the shoes of these other, other folks, these other entities to understand what their needs are, what they're trying to accomplish, and then see where you can find common ground. And sometimes that's, you know, providing folks with some, some links to some resources. Sometimes that's just listening to, to folks and picking up some keywords and saying, oh, hey, I've got some, some techniques that might help with that. And then I think the other piece is um, dream big, but start small so that you can get started. And I've found that there's more acceptance to things that are like a pilot or a trial so that if it's a new technique to folks, they don't feel like, hey, this person's coming in and they're trying to change our entire way of doing things, but instead be like, oh, hey, somebody's approached me. They've done some research, they understand the issues, and they've proposed a small scale solution that we can go test relatively easily and build momentum that way and then invite others in and see, you know, maybe there's some nonprofits that are working on similar issues and sort of build the coalition that way. But um, but starting starting with the with the ed, with educating yourself on the issues and on on what the angles folks are coming from getting that conversation going and growing from there to, to let everybody warm up to the ideas and have some time to, to bat around the pros and cons and how it may or may not fit with their different management needs or capital improvement projects and that sort of approach. Awesome, thanks Jeff. Uh, Martin, in Australia, we have what's called leaky weirs. My problem though, is that the gully system has a lot of catchment. So in a big rent event, a lot of water gets directed into a narrow channel. The soil is what I, what I term is a glorified sand. The more sand is collected, the more grinding away of the gully. It's filled my damn pond with sand, four megaliters of sand. I came in late, so may have missed something. How would you remedy this? Rerouting wouldn't be an option as the terrain is pretty. Uh, so it sounds like you have an incised gully and then also that that incised gully fills a pond or a dam. And uh, so the first thing that I would be looking at is the actual spill into the dam and creating something that you can uh, catch some of that sediment that's coming in called a sediment trap. And then you'll have to clean out that sediment trap um, you know, frequently after rain events to start because you won't be able to stop all the sediment from flowing down that incised gully. Uh, so first thing you do is you protect your, your infrastructure, and then you can start to work in that incised gully uh, with things like one rock dams and baffles or log mats in a way that it helps the gully to widen and that they catch sediment throughout the length of the gully uh, rather than all that sediment just rushing down. And so that that allows it slows the process of the sediment moving down. It also slows the water down so it's not as erosive. And over time, hopefully that gully will widen and do what, what Jeff described. It will create a new incised floodplain. And once you get that incised floodplain, the floodplain will catch and store a large quantity of the sediment that's moving down the system. So first you create something that's basically your stopgap measure, your sediment trap, catch basin that you can excavate the sand out of and just keep it out of your pond at least. And then you can work your way up the gully, uh, slowing down the sediment and water in the gully and widening the gully to ideally create that floodplain, which it will be vegetated and collect and store lots of sediment and water. Awesome. Thank you, Neil. I'd like to hear more about managing ungulates. I want to guide them through the pasture without them creating an erosion channel. Thoughts, gentlemen? Yeah, one technique that I've seen um, effective is what's called drift fences. So, you know, most, most ungulates have the tendency to just follow the valley fall line, they just kind of follow the same line. And so a periodic section of fence to just make them get off that line and sort of, 
it's an induced meandering of the animals, if you will. Um, so that can that can be an effective technique. Um, we've also done some um, exclosures, but that's usually typically a fenced off area to to protect a specific spot versus kind of allowing the passage through. But different different fencing techniques are. Um, I guess you could probably build drift fences out of other materials that just make it less easy to walk the straight line. Awesome. But the other thing you might consider is just increasing the rest periods between when the animals are in each section of pasture so that any trails have a chance to revegetate. Thanks, gentlemen. Uh, from Jamie, it looks like these projects are primarily in dry climates. How do the techniques hold up in coastal high rainfall areas? Uh, well, several of the projects that we showed are up in, in the mountains in wet meadows that are wet areas. Uh, they just have short growing seasons. So those projects um, have fared very well. Uh, they're in, in wetlands and projects with logs tend to work a little bit better if they can stay wet. Um, <clears throat> but in one of the benefits of being in a high rainfall area is that you have a lot more living vegetation to work with. So you get to use other things like pole plantings and live staking and actually just you know planting vegetation. And so that in, in the dry climate, a lot of times you have to wait a lot longer for the vegetation to actually build the robustness of the structure. But in a humid climate, you're really looking at getting that vegetation established quick because the, the roots are what really makes the structure regenerative and hold together over the long time because plants can continue to regrow. So in, in moist climates, you're probably focusing a little bit more on the vegetation component, also because you're not as concerned about retaining the water for growing vegetation. And it's more that you're wanting to grow the vegetation to use the water to transpire it, um, as opposed to having it be flooding or stagnant or causing other sorts of challenges. Awesome. Thanks, Neil. Going back up uh, from an anonymous, how many days of flood guarantees such a structure made of branches? Is it long enough for vegetation to regrow? Not sure I understand that question. Do you guys have a sense of that one? Yeah, so that's it's it's really going to depend. Um, I will say so that um, the brush and mineral terraces that of a project I did in Utah that Neil showed the slide of. Um, those were under feet of water during a hundred year flood event and they held up against way more flood than I ever would intentionally have put them in. That was a little bit of a um, underestimation of how high the floodwaters could get in a um, epic rain event that had severe debris clogging that caused the creek to come even higher and wider. So I can attest that these structures are very strong and stable how long it takes to get vegetation grow really depends on your precipitation regime and how how moist they stay and or if you have access to a water supply and choose to use you know put a drip emitter on it um, you can get vegetation response in the first season or it could lie dormant for years if uh if it you know if you're not having enough precipitation to drive the seed germination and response Awesome. Thanks, gentlemen. Uh, so we've got our next win winner as we're just about uh, through half of our, our Q&A time, just over that. Tracy Ward. Tracy Ward, you've won a spot in the low-tech erosion control self-paced course. Uh, please do email me ASAP to claim your prize. So I know you're here and you've heard it and you've claimed it. Uh, so that's Tracy Ward. You've won a spot. And uh, Javin at All Points Design, I'll make sure that that's in the chat. All right. So our next question is, will there be vegetation growing throughout the rock berms? Does that require weeding? Great question. Uh, ideally, yes, there's vegetation growing through the rock berms. That's, like I mentioned, the regenerative aspect of the structure is the plants because they can regrow and continue to strengthen the berms and the roots will hold the uh, rocks together as well as the soil and sediment. Uh, so whether or not it requires weeding depends on what your interpretation of a weed is. And, you know, in, in my opinion, some vegetation growing is better than none. And the first things that come in may be something that people consider weeds. Um, so it's going to be a balance. What, what I would say is, if you don't like it, try to keep it from producing seed. Or if you have some real nasty, noxious, invasive weed problems, 
don't put your berms right on top of those areas because they're going to really get a good foothold there. Um, so, yeah, you want vegetation to come in, and whether or not it requires weeding again depends on your perspective and your specific situation. Awesome. Thanks, Neil. From Sergey, is there any certification for this type of work? How do business insurance agencies approach insuring businesses like yours if there's no certification? Great question. Uh, there's not per se a specific low tech erosion control certification. Um, I'm a licensed contractor. So in Utah to do this work, at least on private property, you need to be a licensed contractor. So I have the um, landscaping and excavation and grading um, specialty contractors licenses. So far in my work on agency land, public lands, um, they're not necessarily re re requiring licensed contractors, though they do in, in New Mexico. Um, here in Utah, it's a bit of a gray area that I don't think has been tested yet. But being a being a licensed business is the first step, um, and then having relevant experience. A lot of the government contracts coming out in Utah just specify that you need to have a couple years of relevant experience, and then you then you're open to be able to bid on on some of these types of projects. Um, that said, um, there's some courses that you can earn a certificate through. There's Dave Rosgen has natural channel design, and that's a little bit more of a engineered um, working with larger river systems, but has a lot of overlap and a lot of same principles. And he's actually got four levels of certification and certain projects, um, especially ones that need engineering may specify that you need to have Rosgen level two or three or something to be qualified to bid on it. Um, and then uh, Utah State University offers a certificate for their low tech process based restoration of riverscapes and that's really going into a lot of the beaver dam analogs and post assisted log structures and that sort of stuff so it's a university certificate that's a little different than a business license so it never hurts to have some of these certificates and credentials, but my understanding from a business standpoint is it's definitely a business license registered in your state or home country, whatever those processes are, and then possibly a contractor's license as well. And, and if you're just doing design and not doing build, you might also look at something in the US, we have a what's called a certified professional in erosion and sediment control, which is a, another uh, certification that's a nationwide one. And it doesn't specifically focus on low tech erosion control. It has a lot of kind of more industrial erosion control approaches, but that would give you a credential that would, you know, then provide your insurance company with backing and also qualify you for bidding on things. Thank you, gentlemen. We've got a lot of questions concerning the idea of tropics and using these types of of implements in the tropics. So one of these questions is, have you dealt with tropical climates where issues can often be too much water? What are the relevant concepts in these situations? Yeah, I think the beauty of the low tech erosion controls is that the, the anatomy of them, how we shape them is somewhat universal. You just may emphasize certain things over others. So if you are in a situation where you don't want to oversaturate your soil, you may not have much ponding or pooling area. You might still use the same one rock, uh, one rock dam or media luna to slow the flow a little bit or to stabilize the point, but you may not have um, much depth up gradient so that you don't get as much pooling, but it still provides the water a stable spot to flow over. Yeah, another aspect of that is that a lot, a lot of times in the tropics where you have the erosion issues are in your drainage features. So, you know, you're creating these drainage features to allow you to dry out some of the land to do certain farming or other sorts of land uses. But those drainage features end up channelizing and focusing the force of water and eroding and causing some issues. So you could utilize these sorts of structures in those drainage features to help stabilize them so that they don't potentially erode up into a field or something. So you could use a rock mulch rundown as the entry point, um, or you could stabilize culverts with rock armoring on the entry and X and so those sorts of things. So sometimes that's the piece that you're looking at in the tropics is how you stabilize things that you've constructed that are then eroding. 
Yeah, and I can speak a little bit to it as well, seeing as I've worked in the tropics quite a bit and coming off of uh, Neil's conversation, really being conscientious about where that water is channelizing and working and armoring it is important. But at the same time, within the tropics, we're, we're usually using an, uh, a larger toolbox of either water direction or water restoration, including lifting up areas or channelizing areas or working with uh, impoundments. So working with either large ponding structures or other types of earthworks. So generally, when we're taking a look at low-tech erosion control, we're talking about erosion. So wherever we have water that is channelizing and then starting to erode out both the organic matter and then into the parent material, that's really well, where low-tech shines. Uh, from Oliver, I would love to hear you fellas talk a little bit about the business potential of this type of work. Other than private clients, where do the contracts come from and what permissions do you tend to need to access public lands and waterways? Jeff, I know you've done a lot of work on this. Uh, would you mind chatting about that? Yeah, totally. Um, so yeah, private clients is obviously one, but there's also a growing um, bit of state and federal funding for this type of work. I'm involved in um, numerous projects. So it's kind of like the um, let's, like the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Partners, Partners for Wildlife program um, has been getting interested in some of this, this type of work. And they're a federal agency, but they specifically work with private property owners that have high wildlife or conservation values on their property. And then um, also like in Utah, our division of uh, natural resources and specifically division of wildlife resources are often putting out projects of this type on public lands where it's different focuses. Sometimes it's, it's water quality, sometimes it's habitat restoration. So there's sort of a few different angles or themes that, um, that are, are driving some of this work. In terms of like what permissions, generally you're gonna need a um, Clean Water Act and Army Corps permits to work in waters of the US. So that can be a process that can take some, some time. And uh, on a lot of public lands, there's often also a need to go through the NEPA process. And so that's where it's really nice to um, form relationships with agency folks. And some of, sometimes some of these projects can take years to go through the permitting and all the approvals before there can actually be work done on the ground. So it's um, it does take some some patience and working with with the agencies to get those permits in place, get the approvals that are needed, and then you know see about getting the funding lined up to complete some work. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Um, from Jose, can there be appropriate measures that can help in drought? Have you had any experience bringing in water to a landscape that's been degraded? Yeah, go ahead. Neil. Um, so these techniques definitely help areas that have drought. Uh, you know, you need some precipitation to actually make them work. If it doesn't rain, then the structures don't do anything. You know, so. so they don't alleviate a drought. Um, and as, as Jeff mentioned, if you have water and you wanna you know, put some irrigation on to get some plants established, you can do that. That will help the structures. Um, or if you're bringing in water, for example, uh, you know, maybe through something like an Asecchi or a ditch where you're diverting water out of a, a waterway and bring it out in the landscape, these structures can be applied to help spread the water and stabilize that water diversion and that sort of thing. Um, so they, they will help retain water when it comes uh, during a drought. And often a drought can end with a big uh, rain event, with, which can be very destructive because all the plants have died back. So these, if you build these structures when it's not raining, then when it does rain, they will start to function and really help out uh, your landscape during the rain event. Awesome. Thanks, Neil. Well, we folks, we uh, we did our best to get through as many questions as possible. But the more we put, uh, more we answer, the more questions that come up. So we only got time for uh, one more question, uh, and we'll have our final uh, a final winner. And uh, just thank you very much for everybody who who came to the webinar today. There's always more interest than there is time, but we really appreciate everybody coming in and love seeing everybody saying how much they enjoyed the presentation and just a lot of gratitude and thanks. So really appreciate that. Uh, last one's from Nikki. We live in a very steep catchment area. The mountain streams swell to river status very quickly and powerfully. 
We have areas that are badly eroded now. How does one mitigate that seasonal severe force? Great question. Yeah, that is a, that is a great question. And that's um, very similar to Utah and um, Moab where I'm at, where we get the flash floods, we get the monsoons like dry for months and months and then big events. And um, that again, kind of goes down to the principle of the higher up in the watershed you're able to start, the less water volume and the less velocity you have to deal with. So lots of little structures cascading down from high up can help to take some of that edge off. And then the other thing for once it is up to the high flows, the fast and furious water, it's making sure your material size is big enough and you know you build your structures properly so that they can withstand that. Um, it sounds like that may be a situation where it might need to be a, a machine built structure so that you can use some, some really large rocks and boulders that can withstand those flows while also paying attention to the anatomy of, of the of the structure to make sure you're, you know, you're stabilizing where you want, you're deciding how much sediment you want to be able to be caught up gradient of your structure. And then you're making sure that that water can still flow over your structure and on down the line. So it doesn't, um, you know, wrap around or blow out your effort. Great answer. Great answer. Thanks so much, Jeff. And Thanks so much, everybody, for taking the time and the interest as we take a look at uh, degrading ecology across the planet. We need more people active in these types of tools and techniques, and I'm just so grateful that everyone spent the time with us today to talk about this. If you're interested in more of Jeff or Neil's work, I put both of their websites into the chat bar. They're exceptional contractors and consultants to work with. I know uh, Jeff works uh, closer to home, and, but Neil, like myself, will work with folks a little bit further afield, sometimes very further afield. So they're both exceptional people to work with. And last but not least, just remember that if you are interested in this course, we have a great opportunity here within the next four days, the next three or four days before Sunday, this Sunday, Sunday, Sunday at midnight to get $50 off the course. If you're thinking about this work and thinking, man, I don't know if it's for me, go take a look on the landing page, go through the case studies. I highly recommend it. It's basically like an extended webinar. You get so much more time with Neil, Jeff, and myself where they're going into these specific conversations. And a lot of the questions I saw that came up uh, will be answered if you watch through those, uh, those case studies. So if you are interested, make sure to take a look at that. Also, uh, expect, a we uh, expect an email, pardon me, uh, within the next 24 hours with the link for this webinar to go back through and take a look at it. And um, Jeff and Neil, uh, final thoughts before we give that final, um, that final winner away. Yeah, I've really appreciated all the, the great questions, really engaged group. Um, lots, lots of different ways we can put this in, in practice. So I think it's really honing in on, on your specific situations and, uh, and getting started. Start small, dabble, and, and grow from there. But the most important thing, in my opinion, is to, to get started on, on the education and on the action. So have at it. Uh, I second that. I want to say thanks, everyone, for participating. I'm hoping that this is the point that gets you started. And yet, start small and dream big, but start small and build on success because you learn a lot from putting things into practice. Awesome. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for doing the work you're doing. And thanks for being involved in it for so long that you're now at a place where you've got the failures and the successes to share with others, to show them what uh, is possible, to show them that conversation, to be present to that conversation. That's so incredible that you guys are willing to take the time out of your lives and being able to show people uh, what's possible. I so appreciate that. So again, if anybody's interested in that, in the, the low-tech erosion control course and are interested in taking advantage of the, the short uh, availability of that price offering, I put the link there into the chat. And our final winner is Cynthia Rice. Cynthia. If you are here, I uh, I picked your name a little bit earlier, but it looks like you are still here. Cynthia, if you are here, feel free to email me, javin at allpointsdesign.ca, as, uh, as I would love for Jose to email. Um, 
And uh, Tracy, please do email me. That'll be the way to claim your space. Thank you very much, everybody. Please check out regenerativeliving.online for a host of incredible courses and new courses coming up. Sign up to the newsletter. And I wish you all a very excellent day. Take care.